Good morning and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's uh, global PAD webinar. My name is Barbara Manchek. I am a PGY5 resident, uh, ESIR resident at Advent Health in Orlando, Florida. I am proud to be involved with the SIR RFS section. Um, this basically, uh, the SIR RFS is excited to have this series of webinars on uh, peripheral artery disease, one of the most prevalent uh, diseases worldwide. Um, so this initiative is really to um, spark everyone's interest in managing, treating PAD and make us better clinicians. We have uh, today some of the most experienced and enthusiastic uh, international faculty here to uh, present uh, their experience. And um, we have two moderators today, Dr. Vatican Cherry and Dr. Ujianskis. Um, in addition, some of our lecturers uh, will include Dr. Beasley, Dr. Tumala, Dr. Athanasios, Dr. Skiro, Dr. Solberg, and last but not least, Dr. Warwardecker. Um, so just a couple housekeeping rules so everyone's aware um, before we get started. So we have a robust agenda for the day. Um, your active participation is encouraged. There is a um, chat box where you can ask your questions and the, uh, the presenters or the moderators um, will be able to see those and answer those um, throughout the talk. Um, everybody. Um, all the audience is muted so that the, to avoid any background noise so that the lectures can um, present effectively. Um, this webinar is recorded and will be posted at a later time on the SIR RFS uh, YouTube channel. So if you missed the last couple, this is our third one. So if you missed the last few, you can catch those on there. And then this one will be posted in the future. Um, so without taking any more time um, away from our amazing lectures, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our moderators, uh, Dr. Vatican Cherry and Dr. Ujianskis. Good morning, everyone. Great. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I'm very excited to work with uh, Dr. Ujianskis on this uh, webinar. Um, she hosted a, a cook uh, dinner, um, trainee dinner that my residents couldn't stop raving about. So uh, very excited to, to co-moderate. And I agree, what an exciting panel we have to really escalate our you know, treatment of these patients in, in, with critical limb ischemia. Um, so um, I think I'll do the first introduction and then we'll kind of alternate. Um, Brian Shiro is a, a very highly skilled interventionalist and he's a uh, taken over as the program director of the, the world famous Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. And um, he's got some big shoes to fill, but if there's anyone who could do it, I think it's Brian Shiro. He trained at UPMC and did uh, his fellowship as well at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. He has a passion for um, uh, critical limb ischemia and complex aortic uh, interventions. And uh, without further ado, I'm excited to learn uh, from Dr. Shiro. Joji, thank you so much for that uh, very warm welcome. It's, it's good to see you, and uh, and I'd like to thank Barbara and uh, and Rakesh and the rest of the team for really putting together a, a great panel of uh, discussions here, and we're looking forward to, to hearing everything that everyone has to say. Uh, I'm just going to kind of jump right into it here. So I'm going to start out with aortoiliac interventions, and then we're going to have multiple other discussions after that. Uh, here are my disclosures. So what are the keys to success in treating patients with aortoiliac disease? First of all, it starts with a good history and physical examination for sure. You wanna look at uh, non-invasive imaging and in particular, we look very closely at uh, non-invasive uh, arterial examinations with PBRs and duplex imaging, and then CTA and MRA afterwards. Uh, you wanna select the right lesions to treat. You wanna uh, plan out everything well. You need to know what your access is going to be in which directions you're going to you're going to have to go in uh, crossing the lesion and you need to know of course what your tools are so let's start with a case this is a 78 year old male with a history of uh, hypercholesterolemia who presents with uh, one uh, one block left thigh and buttock claudication for the past few years you can see the, the social history and the medications there of course 
many of these patients are smokers uh, and uh, hypertensive as well. So starting out with a good non-invasive arterial exam is really uh, uh, the first step in understanding the disease pathology in these patients. So here this patient uh, has a normal right side, normal waveforms throughout the, the right leg. But if we look at the left side, the patient has dampened arterial waveforms uh, uh, indicating inflow, iliac disease. The patient has good augmentation below the knee, so that indicates that the femoral popliteal segments uh, are going to be normal and then preserve tibial waveforms below that. And then exercising these patients is critical really to unmask any disease that uh, may not be as evident on the, the resting study. So after exercising this patient, the patient develops moderate left leg pain after exercise. And there's a significant drop in the ABI from really mild disease to, to almost severe. Uh, so the, the physiologic study offered by the, the non-invasive exam really is the key to telling you what, what the patient uh, clinically has, what their symptoms are, are going to be related to their disease. CT and MRI are, are great for looking at pictures, but they don't really tell you uh, how significant the patient's disease is. Uh, we know this patient does have significant disease, so the CT is helpful in showing us the anatomical location of where the, the occlusion really is in the iliac arteries. And we can see that there's long segment occlusion of the external iliac artery. Uh, so how are we going to approach this? Uh, we really have two options for crossing this lesion. We can either go from a retrograde approach, which is uh, my preferred method most of the time, or we can come up and over from the bifurcation and kind of push down in, into the, the occlusion as well. Here's the angiogram. It's important to get contralateral access whenever you're crossing these lesions because you need to have good imaging, either contralateral access or access from the arm from above in order to see where the, the reconstitution points are and where you need to cross. This is just some still images of that. And here we, uh, we've gotten access. So what we're using here is a, um, a sheet that has a, a marker tip. And I think this is extremely important to use the marker tip sheet so that you know right where the end of the sheath is and you know where your, your lesion is that you're gonna be crossing. Uh, Oftentimes we use uh, uh, braided catheters to get across these types of lesions and, and uh, uh, I like to start usually with a, a soft glide wire uh, to see if we can kind of navigate through an occlusion and then if that doesn't work we can uh, try some stiffer things here. We used a, an LLT wire which in itself uh, is pretty stiff at the tip. All right, so what's the next step in, in treating patients? Do we do balloon angioplasty or do we actually play stents? So if we look at the STAG trial, uh, this is a, a trial that, that was performed in 112 patients that, uh, that looked at claudicants with common iliac and external iliac disease. The lesions were longer, I'm sorry, the lesions were less than eight centimeters in length. And we looked at patency of uh, stent versus PTA. And what this showed is that patients that got stents had uh, better patency. So for lesions that are eight centimeters or less, uh, primary stenting is really the way to go. So that's what we did here. We used uh, a self-expanding stent uh, after we crossed the lesion. And uh, again, this is in the external iliac artery. And here's the, the end result. So this was an eight millimeter stent. We ballooned it to seven millimeters. Uh, it probably could have gone up a little bit higher. We probably could have ballooned this all the way to eight millimeters. But typically when, when I put a stent in, a uh, self-expanding stent, I usually oversize by one millimeter, and then I usually get the, the balloon to the same size as the, the underlying normal size vessel. And you can see the pre and post here. So marked improvement in blood flow in the left lower extremity uh, following intervention. Uh, looking at duplex, the, the duplex waveform post shows a nice triphasic waveform in the common thermal artery, which is one, what you want to see, rather than this monophasic waveform on the pre imaging, which indicates a, a post obstructive waveform. We don't have that nice dip below the, the baseline, then uh, then we don't have good inflow. So external iliac uh, occlusions, I like to use self-expanding stents. External iliac artery is a, a curved artery. There is some, some flexion there as well. Um, so I prefer self-expanding stents over balloon expandable stents. Um, one thing that I definitely want to point out here is that uh, patients that uh, you're treating these external iliac arteries, it's important to have a uh, covered stent in the room because if the patient does rupture and these external iliac arteries certainly can rupture when you're when you're dilating them, uh, you need to have a covered stent to, to uh, assess any, uh, to uh, treat any emergencies. 
So in this case, the 68-year-old male with Rutherford III claudication for three to four years uh, on salacizol, but uh, still has worsening pain. Again, here's a non-invasive showing significant uh, inflow disease with the splitting of the arterial waveform. Notice here that the below the knee waveform is also dampened, so that's an indication that the patient has femoral popliteal disease. And when we look at the duplex map, uh, the duplex does show that the patient has uh, indeed some distal popliteal disease. This is what it looks like after exercise, which is why exercise is important. So we go from a moderate to a really a critical uh, um, arterial occlusive disease after the patient's stressed. Here's a CT, again showing uh, the occlusion of the, the iliac artery. This actually begins the common iliac artery and goes almost all the way to the, the common femoral. And this just shows the disease within the popliteal. So here's the, uh, the reformats, again, showing occlusion of the, the common iliac artery, basically all the way to the origin of the common femoral. So it's important to talk about uh, TASC lesions and uh, the implications. So TASC is something that was uh, revised in 2007, and really the, the, the discussion at that time was that um, disease should be treated endovascularly that are TASC A and TASC B, so these lesions here. And they reserve TAS C and D lesions for surgical treatment, surgical bypass. Uh, certainly, that has been um, not the, the the way things have gone recently. Uh, the tools that we have now are are great. We're able to actually treat C and D lesions in this uh, Arvissimo trial. Actually, looked at those and talked about um, and showed us that really, irregardless of the uh, I'm sorry, regardless of the uh, TAS category these patients can still be treated from an endovascular approach. So in this patient, uh, we got radial access so that we had some imaging from above. We wanted to stay away from some of the tortuosity in the iliac on the left side. You can see that area of occlusion. And here we go, pushing through. This is a, um, uh, this is a Navicross catheter and we're using a stiff glide wire here as well. And we're able to push through. What you don't wanna do is push through with this knuckle buckled over here. You really want to see if you can straighten out that wire once you get to this point and see if it'll navigate up. We were successful at navigating into the iliac artery, but it ended up going in the contralateral, and, and uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get that wire to go up. Fortunately, we did have access from above, so what we were able to do here is snare that wire and pull the whole thing up. So now we have great access, uh, stable all the way from the right groin through the left radial artery and really have a uh, good rail to bring our devices up. So when we push through with a, a stent, I'm sorry, with a um, balloon, we open it up a little bit. And then which stent should we choose for this? The COBEST trial is uh, the trial that looked at uh, bare metal versus covered stents in, uh, in all TAS lesions. And what it really showed is that in TAS uh, C and D lesions in particular, um, the covered stents perform better than the bare metal stents. The bare metal stents are good for TAS A and B lesions, but TAS C and D lesions are better treated with a, a covered stent. And that's what we ended up doing here. And you can see the, the final images. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but basically this is a study looking at uh, doing just a single stent, a single sided stent, or doing kissing stents at the bifurcation. The reason I pointed that out is because here you can see that uh, we didn't we didn't use kissing stents in this particular case because we felt we were able to land that uh, perfectly right at the origin of the common iliac artery, and that way we're not building up the, the bifurcation too high, particularly in this patient that has a small aneurysm because this aneurysm could expand out over time. You want to preserve the the uh, the bifurcation for future treatments. But what this showed is that there's really uh, no significant difference in, in uh, doing kissing stents versus unilateral stents. Uh, and here is the non-invasive exam afterwards. And again, this is showing uh, significant improvement um, with great inflow. You do see that there's still dampening of the waveform uh, below the knee. The reason for that is because the patient has this residual uh, spinosis inclusion within the artery. So, you know, treating claudicants, it's important to treat the um, treat the inflow disease and really treat them in a stepwise fashion. Most of the claudicants are gonna get better and, and their symptoms may actually go away completely just by treating the inflow disease. If they still have symptoms afterwards, you can always come back later and treat the, uh, treat the uh, popliteal disease. 
So we'll move on to the next case. This is a, a 49 year old male who presents with uh, audication as well. It's lifestyle limiting, very young patient. And we see on the non-invasive exam that the patient has severe inflow disease bilaterally. We have good augmentation below the knee. So although we have poor inflow disease, we know that the femoral popliteal segments here should be in pretty good shape. Here's the MRI angiogram looking at the, the lesion and this patient has a, a chronic Lariche uh, type occlusion. So there's occlusion of not only the distal aorta, but also the common iliac arteries. So here we go, uh, getting through the occlusions, pushing through with a uh, stiff catheter and wire. And when we got into the aorta, we were actually, were not able to re-enter the lumen through the occlusions. And you find that not uncommonly whenever you're going through the, the common iliac artery occlusion. Uh, the, uh, oftentimes you get into a subentimal plane and it's almost impossible to get back in. So there are multiple re-entry catheters. I'm not gonna talk about these too much, just to uh, uh, understand a little bit of how they work. This particular device has a, a, a tip on it that's radio opaque and it shows you directionally where you need to, to point the, um, the tip in order to uh, advance a needle. Once that needle is advanced, then you just push a wire through it and get you back into the lumen of the vessel. So that's what we ended up doing here. We're back into the, the aorta at this level. And we did the same thing on both sides in order to get back in. Um, this was a, a bit of an earlier case. Uh, in these days, I would probably get radial access and have good imaging from above uh, in order to, to see everything that we need to see here. This We didn't start imaging until we actually got this catheter through. And then uh, placing balloon expandable stents. Again, these are covered stents that, that we're placing here. And you can see the results. Now, there are multiple ways of treating uh, bilateral common iliac and aortoiliac occlusions. One way is by placing stents, as we did here. Another way is actually by placing uh, endografts. There are reports of using, in particular, the uh, Endologix AFX endograft that, that sits on the bifurcation. Uh, you can use that as a method to, uh, uh, to restore the aortoiliac bifurcation. I use that sometimes, but pretty infrequently. I find that I, I can get great results just by placing covered balloon expandable stents in this area. The other thing that's important is that you want to be below the inflow of the IMA. You want to preserve that, uh, if at all possible. And uh, here we, we were successfully able to do that. So you can see the IMA is still patent down here. And uh, post-intervention, this patient did great. So the ABI is normalized, and even after exercise, no symptoms. Uh, this is an interesting picture here of where those stents ended up. So you can see the, the calcification within the distal aorta and our stents, remember we were in a subintimal plane. So uh, they actually ended up being placed in that subintimal plane. And if we were to scroll up a little bit higher, you'd actually see them in the, the lumen of the aorta a little bit higher up. Okay, so this is my algorithm for uh, treatment pearls um, for the iliac arteries. So common iliac artery stenosis, if it's a stenosis only, and it's relatively short, I go with bare metal stents. Um, if there are common iliac artery occlusions, particularly long length occlusions, I treat those with covered stents. External iliac artery occlusions, because of the, the bending that's associated with external iliac arteries, we typically go with uh, self-expanding uh, stents. Most of the stenoses we treat with bare metal stents. Long length occlusions, we'll use a covered stent. Um, what's also important, we didn't talk too much about but uh, the most important thing once you're done with this is to check pressure gradients. Um, you wanna see if, uh, if the, the pressures have equalized when compared with the aorta on both sides of the iliac artery. So you want there to be equal pressures throughout. If there's a pressure gradient of about 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury, you need to look a little bit harder and see if there was something left over that still needs to be treated. But that's really the endpoint for treating uh, iliac disease. Um, and then again, try to avoid uh, extending stents too far into the aorta. Uh, one last quick slide. So this is a, um, looking at, at iliac stents. And what you need to keep in mind is that iliac stents have a great outcome and great longevity. At uh, 10 years, we're still better than 80%, even in primary patency of these stents. So uh, iliac artery stents are, are, uh, are a great treatment. It's actually very rewarding because you know you're going to give these patients a, a good, long, durable result. Thank you.
guys have any questions? Uh, I think it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Dr. Skiro. Uh, Dr. Yu and Dr. Lee, uh, you can go ahead next with the, Dr. Solberg's presentation. Yeah, very good. Um, good morning, Agnes. I uh, just want to take a moment to introduce uh, Agnes Solberg. She's an interventional radiologist at the University of North Dakota, and completed her fellowship in California at the uh, University of California at Irvine. Um, and uh, one thing I'd like to really make everyone aware of is that Dr. Solberg has been a very passionate voice for women in IR and uh, really happy to have you here this morning to discuss uh, SFA interventions. Go ahead and take the floor. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I'm having, I'm having all of a sudden some weird computer issue. And um, can you show my, can, can you see my screen? Not right now, but yes. Yes. Maybe you gotta help me because I can't see my screen. It's not coming. See my screen now? Yes. I am so sorry. I'm not quite sure why this is. So, okay, here we go. So I'm going to talk um, quickly about thermal popliteal and the vascular treatment. Um, and essentially, as was mentioned before, if I can move this control panel over. Um, I kind of, when I get new patients, I treat them as um, either asymptomatic, if they're asymptomatic, obviously I don't treat them at all. Um, if they have claudication, it depends on the patient's functional status, their age, severity. I just lost her. Oh, you just lost her. Yeah, um, maybe we can text her. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was a great algorithmic approach for aortic iliac disease. So I think one of the key things is knowing that algorithm. Um, maybe we should call Agnes and just let her know. Yeah, I'm calling her. Um, does anyone um, have any comment? I think some of the things that I think are really important for the trainees, as Dr. Shira's talk was really understanding the physiology and the non-invasive things. Okay. How about so, I? Uh, no, it's okay. How about I let the next presenter go in, and then you can come in. Is that okay? All right. That's all right. Hey, Dr. Beasley. He just went to the restroom. Okay. Uh, we're gonna change the uh, flow of things here a little bit uh, since she's having some troubles with the computer. So is it okay if uh, Dr. D, you go next? Hello, I'm back. I'm sorry, Dr. D, actually Dr. Beasley has to go somewhere. Is it, is it okay if he goes next? Yeah. All right, Dr. B, you're up. All right, I don't know how to share my screen. What do I have to do? Just say, show my screen? Yes, and uh, Dr. We will introduce you. Okay, I can't see my screen. All I can see is you guys' pictures, so. Yeah, we can All see right. you. Here, go there. Okay. Dr. We, you, you are up for yes. Dr. But I can't see my pictures. I can't. Here. Here. No, but. Yeah, you just have to minimize the, uh, the um, the meeting. You should be able to see your behind it. What do we do this? Uh, Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to figure out how to minimize a meeting here. 
Um, no. Get get uh, get Vikash. See if you can get him in here. How to minimize the meeting. You sure? Go grab him. Give me two seconds. Sorry, guys. Which one? This one? Yeah. That one? No. No. Give me two um, seconds. While we're waiting for Bob to, to bring up his talk, I, I, I do have um, a question for uh, and Dr. Shiro. I'm um, um, so when, when doing this complex iliac reconstructions, right, Brian, um, do you use any sort of distal protection devices? Yeah. No, we typically don't. You know, with these uh, chronic uh, iliac occlusions, there usually isn't a lot of underlying thrombus. Certainly in, in someone that has uh, some acute thrombus, we are much more concerned, you know, if they have a, a clinical suggestion that they've had an acute event. Then we do get, get concerned with distal embolization. And what I usually do in those instances is I perform some type of suction thrombectomy to remove whatever thrombus may be above. Um, I've, I've found that that works pretty good. You know, sometimes you do get embolization down the leg and you have to bring your uh, catheter up and over from the contralateral side to go down and chase it, but it's it's pretty rare. With the chronic occlusions, um, we almost never see embolization. Okay, guys, I'm ready to go. Um, I can see my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, let yes. me just introduce you real quick. Okay. Um, Dr. Beasley is uh, not only FSIR, but he's also FSCAI, which is pretty awesome because the only other person I know who's that is Melvin Judkins. Um, board certified, as uh, runs an amazing uh, complex vascular practice in Miami, Card uh, in Mount Sinai, in Miami, and uh, he's been, uh, you know, a great uh, uh, advocate of training education, uh, both at NCBH and SIR and multiple other places. And I appreciate the uh, knowledge that he disperses to our, our our youth. He's been in a lot of carotid stenting trials, including Crest, Crest Two. Um, does complex aortic revascular aortic aneurysm repairs, ton of carotid stenting, a ton of everything, um, ton of complex CLI. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Beasley, thanks for doing this. Okay, Joji, thank you so much, and I appreciate uh, you guys having me here uh, this morning. Uh, sorry about the little mix-up. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and not in Miami, and uh, getting ready to do some work with some uh, with a company up here, um, but. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and uh, let's, let's, we'll get started right away. I'm going to talk about below-the-knee tibial lesions, and specifically, I'm going to talk about stenting. But um, before I talk about the stenting, uh, we're going to review some other stuff, and let me see if I can get this to work here. I'm trying to uh, get this uh, to go. Okay, I, I got it. Sorry. All right. All right, here we go. All right, my disclosures are here. Uh, and then as we get going, so why are we talking about stenting in the tibial arteries? And well, let me just uh, preface this. We'll show some cases in a bit, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the, the stenting in the tibial arteries and why we're considering that. You know, up until this point, and really the only um, FDA-approved procedure uh, for a treatment in the tibial arteries right now is tibial angioplasty. And I'm talking about plain old balloon angioplasty. And I'm talking about drug. We don't have a drug. We don't have anything else uh, to treat now. Most of the treatment modalities that are being utilized are utilized as, um, you know, just as an off-the-cuff type of thing to do because, you know, they're not uh, they're not really um, uh, FDA approved. So I mean, if you're talking about, I mean, I, I know some guys that do stenting of the tibial arteries where they put a full metal jacket all the way down to the to the ankle. I mean, that'll that'll heal a wound. But in the long term, it's going to it's going to have a problem as far as uh, closure, obstruction, that kind of stuff. Uh, other guys are using um, bioreabsorbable stents. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And there has been one trial about 10, 15 years ago that Abbott had for uh, stenting in the tibial arteries, and that really was a failure. But up to this point, really, the only thing we've had is uh, PTA. And so why do we even consider stenting? It's because, as Dr. Bauman showed, uh, in an article in 2014, he looked at a, a series of cases of POBA in the tibial arteries, and he saw that elastic recoil was observed in 97% of the cases that he looked at with up to a third compromise of the vessel within 15 minutes. 
Marion Broadman and Andrew Holden uh, showed that PTA, post-PTA dissection is a common outcome of tibial angioplasty and is a major predictor of restenosis. And Dr. Tepe, who's an interventional radiologist in Europe, showed that infrapopetial lesions are often more calcified and potentially more re resistant to PTA, and these are typically longer lesions. So up to this point, as I was just mentioning, the only bailout you have for failed tibial angioplasty, and failed tibial angioplasty is not just a one-off, it's extremely common. If you do any work in the tibials, as you know, we all do here, you know that you know the recoil, the uh, dissections, uh, everything, is, it, it's, it's there. And I mean, it's not uncommon for me to perform a balloon angioplasty uh, on one side, get an excellent result, you know, for, for wound healing, bring the patient back because there's a wound on the other side, you know, do it up and over. And then while I'm there, take a picture. And I'm talking about a week later, and it, it's, it's down. And that's more common than not. So again, up to this point, the only bailout we've had for failed balloon angioplasty, the tibial arteries, is balloon expandable coronary drug eluting stents. As you know, these are susceptible to compression, to fracture, and this, this causes instant restenosis and occlusion. Also, the stent polymers may serve as an irritant, uh, precipitating instant thrombosis. Again, as far as the self-expanding nitinol stents go, Abbott, back about 10, 15 years ago, had a trial looking at the expert stent. This stent was really a limited stent. It had limited radial forces, limited compression resistance, uh, and it was just insufficient to maintain an open lumen. At the end of six months, severe instant restenosis or occlusion occurred in about 65% of these stents. These stents were also very poorly visualized during deployment, and you really couldn't see where you were putting them, really. So today, uh, if you're not doing transpedal access, retrograde pedal, then you're really not fixing, you're not working in the tibials to, to what you can do. I mean, you, usually you can get through maybe 65% of all the cases anagrade, but retrograde, if you're, if, you, if you're not using retrograde, then you're not really helping the patient because once you do the retrograde pedal approach, you're up to about 95% of all cases you can treat. And if you really haven't had a chance yet to take a look at the In the Vascular Today article by Fadi Saab, looking at the CTOP classification, please do that because that'll help you really save precious time if you want to sit there and play around. And I used to play around the tibial ar arteries for, you know, 20, 30 minutes or so trying to get in from above using all kinds of like crossing wires and, you know, these, these CTO wires that they use in the coronaries. You know, if you can't get through in five minutes, give it up, go retrograde pedal and you're done. A lot of cases, if you look at it beforehand, you can decide that, hey, I'm not even going to, I'm going to go ahead and stick the, uh, you know, the, the DP or the PT first, and then we'll try from above and below and usually get through. So anyway, transpedal access, again, clearly an innovative technique. But today, many of the contemporary treatment modalities of PAD require the use of a five or a six French platform, which you really can't use from a, a retrograde pedal approach. So uh, just to be, a, you know, kind of like, uh, fair to everybody out there, what, what else are, are they using now for treatment of failed tibial angioplasty? Well, Dr. Ramon Varco in um, Australia has done a, um, a registry where he's enrolled about 50 some patients and he's got five-year data, which he presented last year at Viva, which showed that there was a 72% primary patency uh, of his bioreabsorbable scaffolding. Now, um, these, uh, to, be, to be fair, these lesions were all very proximal, uh, proximal one-third of the um, AT, PT, and primarily most of them were the TP trunk. Uh, Stephen Kahn from S Singapore has also got one-year primary patency rates for about 85%, but th this, this is in a registry of about 20 patients and only at one year. And also to be fair, um, uh, Boston Scientific right now is in phase A, of the Saval trial, which is a um, uh, single size, four millimeter outer diameter, eight centimeter long, um, uh, self-expanding nitinol stent, uh, and it's got paclitaxel on it. So again, they're, they've got some work on it right now. They're trying to get some level 1A evidence, and we'll, we'll see how that shows uh, in the future. But basically, up to date, that is all we got going on in the tibials as far as angioplasty and stenting. So I'm gonna tell you about a relatively new stent that I'm involved with. Uh, it's called the microstent. It is sort of like a mini baby supera. It is a tightly woven nitinol design, which conforms to the anatomy of the below the knee tibial arteries. 
has a proprietary platinum core, uh, allowing for superior visualization. You can see extremely easily in angi angiogram, IVUS, and duplex ultrasound. You can easily deploy it from a three French catheter delivery system, so retrograde pedal or anagrade, uh, 40 centimeter platform from a retrograde pedal, goes through a three French sheath, um, and uh, you can go anagrade as well with a 120 uh, centimeter platform. Four diameters, uh, five links, uh, so you can really treat all kinds of uh, vessels, and it goes very easily from the um, uh, to pretty proximal all the way down to uh, the uh, to the ankle. Um, again, you can see here over on the left-hand panel, you've got a um, ibis, which you can see the stent of abut abutting up against the vessel wall very nicely. So immediate uh, clinical assessment of results can be seen. As far as external duplex ultrasound, you can follow up very easily at this patients, uh, these patients. Uh, and you can, you know, re readily see uh, if there's been any incident restenosis uh, on the follow-up studies. So we, where are we at now in the study status? The feasibility study, of the, the first 15 patients that were enrolled in the United States has, has been completed, uh, and it showed a 91% primary patency uh, and a 100% freedom from post-operative from uh, death and from major adverse limb events at 12 months. Um, the uh, HEAL registry is a registry in Europe, which began enrollment in October of 2019 with a PI of Marco Manzi. Uh, and then the STAN study, we are now enrolling. Uh, it's a multi-center perspective, randomized, pitiful study uh, in the U.S. at this time. Going into a little bit more depth, uh, the feasibility uh, study uh, had a broad anatomic distribution of subjects with a high percentage of diabetics. Large number of uh, patients that had coronary artery disease and uh, previous peripheral interventions, as you would expect in these very sick Rutherford 4 slash 5 patients. Um, there were uh, long severe stenoses as well as C uh, CTOs, uh, and lesions were allowed to be treated up to eight um, uh, centimeters. Uh, the adjudicated core lab results 100% delivery success, 100% freedom from. Uh, the primary endpoint at 12 months, which was um, the safety endpoint, uh, which was, again was uh, post-operative death and major adverse uh, limb events. Uh, for uh, the 82% uh, improved for uh, Rutherford classification categories at six months, and 72% remained Rutherford zero at 12 months, which is amazing if you take a look at Rutherford four and five. 91% um, primary patency at 12 months, which is pretty good too. Uh, the STAN trial is the multi-center perspective USIDE pivotal study, which is ongoing, randomized, uh, two arms, two to one microstent PTA versus PTA only. We're uh, going to enroll 177 patients, six month primary follow-up for safety and efficacy. And the enrollment began in March, 2020. Uh, we're gonna have 25 sites. Uh, all, all of the uh, uh, sites had to have a site initiation visit. We had to go to a proto, uh, with protocol training at a hands-on cadaver lab. There you can see Dr. Mustafa and the rest of the guys uh, training. Uh, core lab qualific image qualification was also uh, mandatory. Um, study oversight is uh, with a uh, clinical events committee and a DSMB. These are the investigational sites that are now enrolling uh, in the United States. Um, most a lot of these guys are really, really good in uh, uh, retrograde pedal work, and I think we're going to hopefully get some good uh, results. So, some cases here. Uh, this case is a case I did, a uh, rough before patient uh, presented with moderately calcified, 90% stenosed 5CM lesion uh, with a reference vessel diameter of three in the mid tibia perineal trunk. This patient, uh, in doing the trial, you have to do a pre dilatation first. This patient had a severe. Um, uh, it was stenosis right there on distally and at the TP trunk after the balloon angioplasty. We had a dissection, class C dissection and, um, distally and probably B proximally. I would not have been able to leave this alone and this would have required a coronary uh, drug eluding stent. Uh, we placed the micro stent, post dilated it, had a 10% residual stenosis. Um, uh, the patient's now in follow up, uh, Rutherford 2. And a core lab patency is uh, pending for the 30-day follow-up. Very similar patient here on uh, a, a um, another area in the perineal. Uh, basically had no flow uh, and a large perineal with reconstitution of a DP and a PT. Patient has severe rest pain. 
Um, again, went in there, pre-dilated it, uh, this subtotal lesion, and it dissected the heck out of it. There's no way we could have left that alone. Again, it's a little bit further down than I wanted to play, than I would have wanted to place a um, uh, coronary drug uh, eluding um, balloon expandable stent. Uh, so we did have the option here since the patient randomized to um, microstent to place the microstent. If, if the patient randomizes to PTA and it's a field of failed angioplasty, then you just have to kind of treat the way you're treating these days with, um, you know, whatever off-label um, procedure that you can uh, think of. But anyway, same th same type of deal here. Play, place the microstent after pre-dilatation, and then we post-dilate it. 10% residual stenosis, no complications. Excellent result. Rutherford II uh, and a core lab patency, uh, again, is um, pending. This is a Rutherford V patient. It was performed by Dr. Siddiqui, who is an interventional radiologist up in Wisconsin. Um, he presented with a severely calcified occlusion of the mid aspect of the anterior tibial. Uh, we did a pre dilatation balloon. Thank God he um, randomized to microstent. We did a pre dilatation uh, and it closed right down. Uh, we pre dilated it again, finally got it up to a uh, less than 30% residual stenosis, but I know the thing's going to recoil. So, uh, we, anyway, went ahead and put in a microstent, post dilated it, had a really, really nice result, and I'm really anxious to see. Uh, how this uh, is going to turn out uh, with uh, the follow-up at six months. Again, the HEAL study, um, Marco Manzi in Europe is the PI, and he's got some really good folks um, with excellent um, uh, uh, you know, previous, uh, uh, Dr. D uh, Schmidt and Andre and, and Dr. Scheinert from uh, uh, Leipzig and Marian Broadman and all these guys have fantastic experience. So we're going to see some, uh, hopefully, good results uh, coming in from Europe in this um, uh, this registry. Uh, the uh, enrollment began again in October and they've enrolled 60, 70 patients so far uh, at this time. So in conclusion, as CLI fighters, we need to have stents in the tibial vessels um, to treat these long calcified lesions that have um, recoil, uh, so that we can heal these patients in a, in, a, in a much easier, better fashion. We need reliable platforms, a low profile with adequate radial strength and compressive resistance to oppose recoil and very low chronic outward force to achieve optimal vessel wall apposition without having significant instant restenosis. These stents should be very easily visualized under multiple modalities. Um, and we want, we, we, and we'll need stents and not only the microstent, but also Saval, that is gonna have level 1A evidence, you know, multi-center randomized controlled trial, so that we can say, okay, this is something we should use in below the knee tibial arteries. And again, a low profile delivery system would be uh, something we would des desirable with short and long delivery links. So with that, I'll conclude my uh, talk and uh, we can move on for, to other folks if you'd like, and then uh, we'll be around hopefully for questions at the end. Thank you. Hey, Bob, real quick, when do you expect um, the micro stunt to become widely available? So we are, we probably enrolled a quarter of the patients right now. And, uh, you know, FDA takes a while to um, go through their, through their, um, uh, you know, their, their, their stuff. So uh, it's probably going to be at least a year before we're finished with the trial, given the COVID situation ongoing right now. Uh, and then FDA review, um, you know, six month primary patency, six month uh, safety. So year and a half, maybe two years, something Great, like that. Great, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, uh dealing with these uh, online issues as we know online fuss is always going to be there as long as we do these sessions so uh coming back to the uh the way the agenda was decided i think we can go back to dr solberg now she's uh working with us so if you guys are okay then we can have dr solberg back Dr. Solberg, you're up. Hi, no, yep, yeah, yeah. So it won't wouldn't let me unmute myself why once I'm in presentation mode. Um, so I apologize about that. My computer just stopped working. So I had to get another one. 
So I, I do I, apologize. So <laughs> last time it was a flat tire, you know. Um, so I was asked to speak about femoral popliteal interventions, and thank you so much um, for this um, awesome Let opportunity. Let me also introduce that. Oh, sorry, for, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Solberg, um, she's a graduate from UCI Vascular Interventional Radiology Fellowship. She's got a, a robust uh, peripheral vascular and even stroke practice in um, in North Dakota. Or, I'm sorry, in um, North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota, right? <laughs> And uh, she's heavily involved in women in IR and uh, um, also on Twitter, and you should follow her on Twitter. Um, and uh, she's done some great work in uh, you know, resident and student uh, education, and not only women in IR, but also women in radiology, a strong proponent of that. Uh, again, she's one of the few that does both stroke and complex peripheral interventions and aortic interventions in her, in her state. So. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Solberg on our on our conference call, educating the, the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Vitek and Sherry. And um, I'm hoping that my internet keeps up with this presentation. This is North Dakota, after all. So, um, so essentially, when I get these um, uh, patients for um, for peripheral arterial disease, we do have a clinic where we see them, um, and um, the PAD patients for me fall into three categories, asymptomatic patients who are claudicants and critical in ischemia. The asymptomatic patients we usually don't, don't treat other than their, their secondary um, uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, peripheral arterial disease is a coronary arterial disease equivalent, and you really treat them as if they've had a heart attack. They go on baby aspirin and a high-dose statin um, on an ACE inhibitor, et cetera, as, long, as, as well as lifestyle modifications. and um, so we do do that for the patients and we do follow them up even if they're asymptomatic. For clonicants, um, as far as whether we treat, I treat or not, it depends on the patient's functional status, age, severity of claudication. I think we used to treat a lot of these patients um, even five, 10 years ago. And we're, we're finding that not all of these, some of these patients do really well with celastazole and um, with um, lifestyle modifications. Um, but I do treat clonicants. Um, critical in ischemia, obviously, those patients will require either endovascular treatment or surgery. Um, and um, uh, essentially, as far as FEMPOP treatment, you have to have inflow. So if you don't, so that's that was kind of the first lecture of this um, of this little webinar. Um, if you don't have inflow, you know, fixing the FEMPOP isn't isn't going to be do, do much for you. As far as the role of first surgery, it's still controversial. I think the use of um, endovascular treatments is increasing. And um, th there are very few studies that actually compare bypass to um, interventions that we do by us, you know, not by other specialties, by interventional radiologists. Um, and um, you know, this, all this, all the studies that are available are very, are they're, they're small, um, and they have a lot of issues um, as far as you know being up to date with the with the current therapies that we actually do. For example, this basal one trial um, didn't use drug coated balloons; they put in very few stents. They didn't use atherectomy, so I mean it's not really comparable. Um, and um, and again, endo and endovascular technology is improving. So who do I send to the surgeon? Usually, if somebody, if the entire you know SFA is is out and the patient has a patent GSV and they would want a surgery, like that's somebody I also have seen by the surgeon, and then we kind of decide what we should do. Um, also, if the patient has really severe common femoral artery disease, um, you know I send those people to the surgeon too, and then. You know, as far as the SFA disease, we, we kind of decide what to do that. Um, the surgeons don't like to go in the groin toy, so sometimes they'll do a thumb pop bypass if the patient has SFA and SFA disease. So, um, but my approach, um, and I wish I could see my own picture, but um, we do, a, you know, full history of physical ABI. We do a, sometimes we'll do a CTA. Sometimes we'll do an ultrasound. It depends what all the information is just for me to plan my procedure, decide where, I, you know, how I'm going to do it. Um, I prefer enter great SFA access for FEMPOP disease if it's possible. And I know though it's in that, and just so you guys know, that is not standard. Most people use common femoral artery access and go up and over. Um, and, I, and I do go up and over for some things, but I just feel like with the devices I use, I have much better pushability if I go enter a grade. Um, but, but, you know, there, the SFA access does have more, um, can have more complications. I, um, it's harder to hold pressure. Um, so um, if you can't use a uh, closure device, it's definitely not a good choice. I'll go up and over for those patients. 
Um, then I usually what I'll do is um, after I get in, I'll do a runoff of the leg just to kind of have a baseline. I'll use IBIS to look for um, occult stenoses that aren't identified on your runoff. I'll assess plaque morphology and measure vessel diameters. And I measure the vessel diameters using the IBIS, not using angiography as far as sizing my, um, sizing my balloons and stents. Come on, next slide. There we go. Um, so roll of uh, non-drug balloons. Um, essentially, I will. I do treat um, just angioplasty for certain uh, for a certain subset of patients. Um, usually, for patients who have soft, pla soft plaque lesions that are short, um, and um, those patients will get angioplasty for three minutes. Um, I also use balloons for vessel prep, like prior to using a drug coated balloon or placing a stent. And I'll, obviously, like for bailout for complications, you have a, a dissection. You know, usually what I'll do is I'll try just to end you, you know, just to tack it up with a balloon. Um, atherectomy. Um, so here you have a. Um, uh, so this is actually a case. So this is a patient who, who is had critical ischemia. He came in with a, a chronic total occlusion of a large portion of the superficial femoral artery. Um, the SFA here does try to fill in from these vigorous, vigorous um, profunda collaterals. And um, this is his foot, which isn't bad, but I had to wait a really long time for that picture. And he had ulcers. I could not get um, to the, into the SFA from above. It was a rock. I tried to go up and over. So I actually ended up doing popliteal access. Um, and it did take a long time, um, but uh, was able to, to get access and um, get through that occlusion. And uh, the SFA osteum is very tricky. And this patient was not a surgical candidate. Um, if the disease you know, extends into the common femoral artery, I tend to, again, work, to work closely with my surgeons just to really try to figure out what is the best um, treatment for this patient. I, I, I don't like to do treatments that are their bypass targets. So you have to kind of be aware of what surgeries they, you know, they offer um, and um, whether this patient would be a, a candidate in, in, the, in the future. I'm at the ostium there when, if they have a lesion, um, you can either do a, like a direction or atherectomy. So it's an atherectomy device that you can point um, like right or you know, left or posterior. Um, and you can, um, you can kind of shave down the calcium just in that direction. You can do angioplasty with kissing balloons, like one in the profunda and one in the uh, SFA. Um, or what I did in this case, I put a safety wire in the profunda um, and there's also the prey technique where you don't try to protect the profunda, but I don't like that technique. So, um, and then we already talked about surg the, the surgical options. Um, and um, some other options um, for recalcitrant lesions in this area. Um, you know, I, now that we have drug eluding stents, that is my choice, is, would be the drug eluding stent, because I don't want to cover any part of the profunda with a covered stent, obviously. Save the profunda should be your guys' goal when treating SFA disease. Um, the, the profunda is the patient's lifeline. Um, and so I tend to, I, I, we have alluvia stents, so that's kind of what I use up there. Um, so that even if it, you know, sticks out into, you know, profunda one or two millimeters, I, I kind of feel better. There's no Gore-Tex there. Um, um, cutting balloons, well, you know, that's, that's a little bold, but, you know, that can be done as well if the lesion is really recalcitrant. Um, so this was a, actually the popliteal injection that demonstrated the extent of that chronic total occlusion. I used a spider uh, distal embolic protection device. Um, this is when I was um, just getting used to using the jet stream, believe it or not. Um, so I use that for almost every case. I use it a lot less now. So that catches kind of like the little bits. Um, I use the jet stream for, I tend to use jet stream for long um, chronic total occlusions of the SFA. That's my favorite go-to device. I know that some people do like other devices more. Um, I go with the blades down. The jet stream has a blades down and a blades up option. So it's, if it spins uh, clockwise, I think that it's the blades roll down. So it's a narrower lumen. And if you spin it the other direction, the blades are up and it's a little bit more wide um, and aggressive um, atherectomy. And um, this is just the result from one pass with the blades down um, and it's just a fantastic, fantastic result for this heavily calcified lesion. And um, this patient actually ended up not getting a stent. Um, I don't have the, the final image because also my videos did not, are not playing, but um, 
This patient had a great result from atherectomy. So a little bit more about rotation atherectomy. Again, jet stream is the device I favor above the knee. Um, like I said, there are, two, there are two settings. It also does aspirate. And I definitely, I've definitely, as I've done more of these PED cases, um, how I use it has definitely evolved. Um, I used to just go all the way through the lesion, like a long chronic total occlusion and use the spider device. Um, now I tend to um, go about nine tenths through the lesion and leave about a half a centimeter or one centimeter cap and go blades down and then go blades up, leave the cap because the, the, the device also aspirates. And, um, and so you're really not gonna trash your, your, your lower leg as you're aspirating and you have that cap. That cap is your spider device, except you're not paying a thousand dollars. And then after I'm done that, then I, then I perform the atherectomy on that last centimeter there on the bottom. And um, that does really well. Another key with using the jet stream device when, if you start using is to go very slowly because you have to give it time to aspirate. If you go too fast, um, you, will, you will make chunks that, you know, little calcium, little chunks that, I'm trying to find a, think of a fancy word for chunks that will go down the leg. Um, rotablator for below the knee, um, I don't favor that device. Um, diamond back is, is what I favor for below the knee. Um, that makes um, much smaller um, debris, kind of like sand. So no need for a distal embolic protection device, um, but you need to give it more time or the sand will fill the distal vessels. So you have to wait between, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can use it for several minutes and then you need to wait and allow the body to kind of catch up and wash out all this, I call it sand. Um, the Rotorex device, which I'm not too familiar with, never used it. And I've never used the Phoenix device, but I've heard people of using it and I've heard great things about it. We just don't have it. Um, so I really can't comment on it. So if after I'm done, somebody else can comment on the Phoenix device um, or the Rotorex, um, I just don't use those devices. There's also a laser. Some people favor laser for a very hard calcified lesion. Um, I don't use that um, uh, on a, usually on a first uh, attempt. Um, and then also shockwave lithotripsy. I also I just don't have that. Um, drug coated balloons. So there is the paclitaxel controversy, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. But essentially, what I try to do is I still use drug coated balloons, and I still um, I still use um, drug-coated stents, but I try to use one balloon per patient to just keep my paclitaxel dose lower, I guess. Um, I, I'm not convinced that paclitaxel actually kills people. How's that? <laughs> um, the drug-coated balloons do have a better uh, primary patency rate than uh, regular balloon angioplasty. I'm getting a text message. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to hurry up or um, anyway. And uh, longer term data favors impact over Lutonix, in my opinion, the studies are very different. So it's very hard to compare these studies. They have different lesion lengths, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as you trainees are evaluating these studies, pay close attention to exactly how the study was done. How many patients, you know, how long was the follow-up? What did they treat the patients with after the patients went home? These things are all very important and they do change your, your outcomes. So they could be very similar, um, but I favor the, the um, the impact impact balloon. Um, uh, serolimus drug coated balloons are on the horizon. Um, Magic Touch um, is, a, is, a, is a certainly is a balloon that's uh, being studied right now and uh, I believe is used in Europe or studied in, is studied in Europe. Um, and um, I think it was, uh, was presented at Charing Cross. Stents, bare metal stents. Um, in the SFA, self-expanding stents is what you really want to use. I avoid using um, stents, bare metal stents, except in very, very certain, like special circumstances, um, like proximal SFA at bifurcation before alluvia. That's where I would use a bare metal stent. And then Supera. Supera is the only stent, is the exception to this no bare metal stent in the SFA rule for me. Um, because it's fantastic for um, in the yeah. SFA and in the popliteal artery especially. Um, I favor covered stents for the SFA proper, um, not for the popliteal artery, of course. Um, what is going now? Can you guys hear me still? What's going? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry, sorry. I heard some other people talking, so I want to make sure, sorry. Um, and Biobond is what I have here. Um, you do lose your collateral, so you want to be you know, careful as long as, as far as the length of the stent that you're using. But um, studies have shown, um, even in the surgical literature, 
that you do want to cover the entire lesion, not little spots, right? So if there's a long, you know, long lesion, I mean, you, you, you need to cover the lesion or the patency rate is better for, for longer stents if it's a long lesion. Don't just cover the most stenotic part. Um, but we're really not doing those full metal jackets anymore where people used to stent from, from the, you know, from the um, common femoral artery bifurcation to the popliteal artery. That's really, that's really not done anymore. Um, Drug-coated stents, alluvian, silver PTX. I think there's a third one whose the name I forgot. Is it sterile, sterile X, something with a star? I can't remember. It starts with an S. Um, and um, I, I, I like the data of alluvia a little bit better, but I think it, again it's debatable. The studies are not don't have the same characteristics, um, and so I'd be interested to know with it which one everybody else likes. I don't. I still tend to favor Viabon for lesions that are heavily calcified um, and the drug coated stents for um, bailout for soft plaques. Um, but again, I'm interested to, you know, failed soft plaques, but I'm interested to see what other people think as well. Um, so this is just a little bit about the Imperial Long Lesion Study. Um, they actually do have some longer lesions that they, that they covered that did pretty well. This was prevented at Viva um, this year, actually, um, with an 80.1, 80, 80 uh, I'm sorry, with the primary patency rate of 77.2%. So um, it's not too bad. Anyway, so here's another case, 70 year old male presented with a necrotic foot. Um, and he did, he is not a, this is again, a guy who's not a surgical candidate. So we know he has common femoral artery disease plaque. Again, the proximal SFA plaque, you know, suboptimal for endo, but, um, but you know, I, you have to treat him. And I, you can't just treat those, big huge chunks in the SFA that you see in the middle image. I mean, you have to treat your inflow. Um, and so this patient again was not a surgical candidate. So um, this one again was treated with a with a um, with with angioplasty um, and uh, with a wire in the profunda um, just in case I you know I dissected. Mm -hmm. I used the jet stream. I used the jet stream here for those lesions uh let me see in that middle image you can see there are those large chunks but there aren't very many of them so i did just atherectomy on the, where the lesions are not the entire length of the sfa or the popliteal artery um and um after so i did that and i ballooned it and then i got no flow like we went from flow before when the patient came in to no flow and this is like the worst outcome you can have when the patient actually had some flow at the beginning of your procedure and now has none. This is bad. Um, so I ballooned again, no change. Try not to panic, right? Um, and it, just so you guys know, I do anticoagulate all of these patients. So um, for um, so for SFA, I don't always stop their blood thinner. Um, depend, it depends on, on how I feel as far as the risk. Um, but, if I, but if they're not anticoagulated, they do receive heparin during the procedure. So it turns out that the spider device, because I was using a spider device for this embolic projection, was so full that it was obstructing the flow, and the entire SFA had thrombosed despite the heparin. So, nonetheless, um, I ended up uh, having to actually deploy a stent graft, um, and um, this is what a thrombus inside a stent graft looks like. I mean, this was just a horrible case. This patient had a series of unfortunate events um, that evening um, when he was on the floor and um, he was actually presented at our, our m, &M conference, um, uh, which were obviously not the IR, not our fault, but his, um, his platelets and anticoagulation were reversed. So he got platelets, cryo, FFP, and then my, 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 my stent thrombosed, which is expected, right? It was just placed. So, um, Anyway, that was a long, that was, that was, that was quite a case. He came back to us, to, to, you know, two more days and eventually everything turned out okay. But yeah, that was, a, that was a case. That's all I can say. Um, this next case is an athlete. He's in his sixties um, and he adamantly didn't want, not want surgery. He presented in his popliteal artery, chronic total occlusion, no other lesions anywhere, healthy guy. So this is very unusual. Um, so I did actually try to rule out entrapment to popliteal and ventricular cystic disease. He got an ultrasound MRI, didn't find anything. So I'm still not quite sure why he has this. Um, but um, 
could not cross. I spent four hours trying to, to, to cross this lesion with every single wire. Um, I won't tell you how many Asahi Estados I damaged um, during this case. <laughs> um, but I mean, I tried, tried everything. Tried from going from above, trying to go, try and go from, from below, um, using all of our, you know, every, every wire. I've op I opened 10 wires, I think, I don't know. Um, but I could not get through. I really did not want to go sub um on this patient because of his age um, in the popliteal, like in this region, you know, because it didn't, so. Um, so I actually sent him home and I brought him back because I wanted to, bring, to try the crosser and I've never used it before. Um, and I, we didn't have it. So I had to order it just for this one patient. Um, and the crosser works best kind of on a fresh lesion as far as crossing. So this device is used to just cross the lesion. It's labeled as an atherectomy device, but it doesn't debulk very much. It just creates a path for you. Um, so I did use the crosser to cross this lesion and I, it worked very well. Some people love the crosser and other people hate the crosser. Um, and it's the only time I've ever used it and it worked great. So pretty much that's my experience with the crosser because we don't have it standard. Um, but man, it was, it worked great. So I was able to cross it intraluminal. I checked with Ibis to make sure I was intraluminal. Um, it was a very tight lesion. I mean, I couldn't, I had trouble advancing these, the larger balloons. I mean, I had to use the one, like a 1.5 or two millimeter balloon and then and then go up from there. And then, it, then I used jet stream atherectomy um, and um, he, I think he ended up with a supera stent and he's, doing great. He's doing fantastic. Um, as far as issues with stents, stents can fracture, um, especially our, the older stents. You can have instant restenosis. Um, and so for instant restenosis, we'll get a fibrous cap that's convex. And sometimes it can be actually tricky to cross. And sometimes you have to go from below. Um, and then the other issue is that instant restenosis contains friable thrombotic debris. Um, the I, just important for you guys to know when you size your stents. So I size my stent to the diameter of the healthy vessel that I measure with IVIS, above or and below the lesion. And um, do not oversize your stents because that has a higher instant restenosis rate. Um, this is a case of instant restenosis that was treated with a, with a laser. Um, I like, I use, uh, atherectomy devices. I don't, I have laser. I'm just not super comfortable using it. Maybe I should try it more. Um, but I, I use atherectomy, um, and, uh, a drug coated balloon for all my, for most majority of my instant restenosis, I guess, that aren't just thrombos flat out. Um, and, um, so the bulking, whichever way you choose to do that and drug coated balloon, uh, is what I usually do. Um, some people will reline with covered stents from if patients have multiple instant restenosis events or they're frequent. Um, and uh, there's really no benefit to drug eluding stent over the drug code coated balloon in the setting of instant restenosis. So that's that. Um, for fractured stents, well, you just have to fix the fracture. So you either cover it with a covered stent or, or Supara stent. Um, or at some point they might require a bypass, but um, covered stents work pretty well. It's usually my go-to. If somebody else favors Supera, I'd like to know. Um, and then after patients have procedures with me, I usually give them baby aspirin. Um, I'm starting to use Xarelto for the majority of my patients, a low dose Xarelto twice a day, um, and um, baby aspirin and Xarelto, and then Plavix and Xarelto if they've had a stent placed. Um, I used to do baby aspirin and Plavix, but now I, I kind of chose into this. And when it's time for the patient to get off their Plavix, um, you know, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, depending on the scenario, um, then I switch them to baby aspirin and Xarelto. And then, of course, every one of my patients in every note, um, we discuss secondary CVD prevention. Um, it used to annoy our referrers initially because they were like, why are you telling me? I was like, well, the patient's not on a statin. So, um, why not? You know, so, but now they're they're used to it and they actually they like it that we address all you know these other issues. And then follow up. Um, I follow up patients at usually about a month, um, and then after, if they're doing fine every th three months for a year, and then annually. Um, so again, in summary, when you guys treat um, SFA disease or any disease, 
the first thing to know is that, you know, what are the patient's symptoms? They have claudication or, or, or is it critical in ischemia? Like, are they going to lose their leg? Um, what is the plaque made out of? Is it a soft plaque or is it a calcified plaque? And you can check with IVIS. And sometimes you can just see in your angiogram, right? And you can see on an x-ray whether there's calcification or not. Again, for soft lesions, I tend to favor um, angio, uh, regular angioplasty. Is a drug coated balloon if recoils. For calcified lesions, I tend to use atherectomy um, and drug coated balloons. Um, and depending on the length of the lesion stents, and sometimes just and stents, of course, for bailout. Um, um, and then you, you have the choice of drug eluting stent, covered stent versus supera. And I think that they have very similar, pretty similar outcomes, you know, once you correct all the studies. So um, again, I, I tend to favor the covered stent for um, for hunters, for hunters, for, for SFA down to mid, mid, mid hunters canal, then mid hunters canal below, I'll tend to use the supera, and then I'll tend to use the alluvia. For any anything in the in the first um, in the first third of the SFA, so I know that was a whirlwind. So, are there any questions, Dr. Solberg? Thank you so much for this absolutely fantastic overview, and I really admire you for the persistence that uh, you've demonstrated in these particularly complex cases. I think it's really important for the trainees to, to see that, you know, and to recognize, yeah, we have all these tools available, use them, you know, use them wisely. Thank you for certainly categorizing how you attack the different uh, types of lesions, whether soft plaque or calcified plaque. So again, thank you very much. And thank you for your patience too in dealing with the uh, technical issues. So thanks again. Oh no, thank you so much. I think the issue was on my half, not your guys'. So, um, and then just for, as far as the trainees, I think that there is no right or wrong. I think someone else who will give this the same, um, the same presentation can give a very different overview um, because I think that there's much more diversity in how to treat SFA and popliteal disease compared to like aorta iliac interventions and things like that where it's more standard standardized. But um, I think there's much more debate. So this is not the Bible, it's just a suggestion. I have a quick question uh, since we had basic two uh, complex talks, but especially for Dr. Beasley, because you gave a, a talk on micro stent. There was one uh, other talk we had heard on PAD Bootcamp episode one about the bioresorbable stents, which are also coming out for uh, below the knee interventions. So just wanted to hear your viewpoint about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. And you're talking about the um, the the bioreabsorbable stents. Uh, my viewpoint, I mentioned it quickly in passing on my talk. Uh, again, two studies, uh, Dr. Raymond Varco um, out of Australia, he did a study um, uh, starting, I guess they had five-year pr uh, primary patency results at Viva presented in 2019. Uh, he had a 72% primary patency uh, of the uh, bioreabsorbable stent that he used by Abbott, and it was a, um, uh, I think, um, 50 some, 52, 53 patients. Uh, the, the stent was taken off the market because of issues. Uh, it's a coronary stent they were using uh, as off-label in the um, TP trunk and proximal AT and PT. They took it off the market because of the issues they were having in the coronary with uh, stent thrombosis. You don't really have too much of a leeway there in the coronaries. If you have a couple of stent thrombosis, then that supersedes anything else. Uh, they are right now uh, re-looking uh, at the stent. I think they're retooling it, re-engineering it, and I think they still are thinking about bringing back a bioreabsorbable stent trial in the next uh, year or so. And again, I, I mentioned Dr. Steeman Combe from uh, Singapore who did a one-year um, uh, trial with uh, the, the same stent that, that Raymond used, and it was... Um, uh, 85% primary patency with about 20 some patients at one year. So again, these are registries. Uh, there's no uh, randomized control trial, but I know Abbott is thinking about and trying to do that in the future. I think there is some some um, promise for that platform. Wonderful, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Varvadekar will be next and Dr. Yaginskis will be introducing him. So good morning um, from Indiana, um, Dr. Varvadekar. I understand you come to us this morning from Mumbai, India. So really extraordinary how we are a global community getting together to discuss PAD. Um, just to uh, let everyone know, uh, Dr. Uh, Warwadakar um, is a very highly recognized IR, um, has been a very, very strong force in, the Indi in India's Society of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. He has served um, posts as vice president and president of that society and was awarded the gold medal back in 2019. And uh, this year he received uh, the award as fellow of the Society of Interventional Radiology. So uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Warwadakar for joining us today. And he's going to be speaking to us today in regards to popliteal interventions. Please proceed, sir. Thank you, thank you, Erica. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Uh, and uh, can you see my screen? No, I think you have to click the PowerPoint. Uh, it's uh, it's minimized. Pardon? Yeah, Your PowerPoint but I can't. PowerPoint is minimized. Dr. Varvadikar. Did we lose you? Hello? I think we have lost him. I think his screen is frozen. Uh, maybe we'll come back to him as soon as he's logged back in. Dr. D, uh, would you be op open to going next, please? Yes, sir. There you go. And uh, Dr. V can introduce Dr. D. Um, I think Dr. V may be offline right now. He was having some issues. So, um, uh, Dr. Diamantopoulos, I'll introduce you, and I hope that I said that correctly. Um, and uh, so he joins us from London and is the uh, chief of uh, IR at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospitals and is a senior clinical lecturer at the King's College in London. And um, so he's going to be speaking to us today in regards to instant restenosis. I'm really excited to hear your, your talk about this. It is a become the bane of our existence in IR for those of us who do PAD. Uh, so please proceed. Thank you very much for the introduction. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much for the kind invitation. Yes, you said my name very correctly. Thank you very much for that. This is always a challenge. And I'm very pleased and I'm excited and uh, from the great uh, presentations that we heard so far. And I think all the presentations so far highlight the fact that we know nothing about peripheral arterial disease so far, and we know nothing in terms of how, what is the absolute best algorithm for these patients. It's like we always try our best. However, we the, the ultimate and the best uh, uh, intervention for the patient is not known. It depends on multiple factors. These are my disclosures. Basically, regardless of all the new technologies and new techniques that we have in terms to treat the thermal PPL segment, we still end up using quite a lot of stents. Stents are extremely important because they help us to increase our procedural technical success. They are related with higher technical success compared to just plain old balloon angioplasty. And it is estimated that more than 30% of 30% of patients that they are treated in the United States today are 
taking our receiving stent as a combination with the angioplasty, independently if that angioplasty is with a drug eluding balloon or with just plain old balloon angioplasty or a thorectomy. Uh, the stent have, as I said, increased massively the, the, the technical success, however, suffered from not great primary fitting. The more recent stents, with uh, uh, like the Supera, the Everflex, the Epic stent, the Smart stents, which are, have improved design and improved flexibility, have managed to increase the primary patent rate of the early uh, nitinol stents used, and that ranges between 76 and 88 percent, with a TLR of maximum 21 percent of the available registry data that we have today. Despite that. There is a big issue which still remains, as you said, Erica, earlier, which is the instant stenosis. Instant stenosis refers to lumen loss, which is volume loss of the uh, previously extended segment due to ingrowth of cell, extracellular matrix, and thrombus. The instant uh, in stand stenosis refers basically to the previously extended segment including approximately five millimeters above and below the standard segment. And I think that's very important for our, the trainees to understand that it's not just the stand, but it also includes the margins when we refer to this, uh, to the instant stenosis. It has historically been very difficult, a very difficult clinical problem, and it's known to be underestimated. And the reason why the incidence of instant stenosis is underestimated is because I believe that we lack of proper follow-up of our patients. We don't follow the, the patients that they have and the vascular procedures in the same way that the surgeons follow the bypass. We don't pay the same attention as the surgeons pay to their bypasses, which is probably the reason why the, and the vascular treatments are not the durability of the uh, bypasses in the long term. It is estimated, unfortunately, that up to 40% of patients that they receive stents will have some degree of instant stenosis within two years of their stent. That accounts on a very high number of more than 100,000 cases of patients having instant stenosis per year in the United States of America. So how we classify it? If this one is just from one small study published in 2012 from uh, Dr. Kosaka, which has classified the instant stenosis in three major categories. Class one, when the stenosis refers to less than five centimeters in length of the stent, either focal or diffuse. Class two, when this is more than five centimeters and it can involve the um, margins of the stent. And class three, when the whole stent occluded. And this classification has, as we will see in a few minutes, been related to different rates of primary patency and different rates of stenosis and uh, uh, target using vascularization as well. What is the treatment? Well, there have been several techniques and approaches proposed for that, which includes angioplasty, either with plain old balloon, cutting balloons, or drug coated balloons, stents, like cover stents or drug eluting stents, which have been discussed by the uh, and Jager or atherectomy, debulking technique using laser, direct or traditional devices that are available in the market today. What is the main challenge? And I think this is very important because knowing the challenges will help the operator to decide what is the best treatment of the particular patient that they're treating on the specific setting. So the main challenge is when we're treating a native artery with, for example, plain balloon and zeoplasty, it, the balloon tends to fracture and collapse the atherosclerotic plaque while at the same time increasing the cross-sectional diameter, giving a lumen gain that is big enough in order to create the lumen that will help with the flow of the, uh, of the blood. Now, when we have a previously standard segment, like in this case, the lumen that the balloon can spread is limited and the expansion of the plain balloon angioplasty is, uh, capabilities is limited to the size of the stent. We cannot stretch the lumen more than the actual stent size. We can try to stress it, but that may make it even 
worse in terms of creating a future fracture of that stand. So the hypothetical lumen gain in this case, when we're creating instant stenosis, is restricted by the actual size of the previous stand. Now, let's see what the literature tells us about the results of the different techniques that have been mentioned already. So, regarding the balloon angioplasty, from the study that uh, Tosaka and, uh, and colleagues from 2012, we've seen that there is a direct, a direct correlation between the class of the instant stenosis and the recurrence of the stenosis after balloon angioplasty in an instant stenosis after a year. So, the class one is has a very low stenosis, up to 50%, while the class three, which to remind you, it correlates with total occlusions, that stenosis rate after a year can be up to 85%. As mm -hmm. you can imagine, that is because the lumen, initial lumen gain is not great because the thrombus and the fibrotic tissue that is causing the total occlusion has nowhere to go since there is the, the stretching capabilities of the vessels are restricted from the presence of the previous stem. So you can, someone can say, and this has been uh, reported in several uh, studies, that the balloon angioplasty is in, in, a, in an ineffective treatment for femoropopletal instant restenosis lesion and for uh, specifically for instant occlusions. Another approach that has been proposed using cutting balloons, again, this has been proven uh, not effective with the difference between cutting balloons and plain old balloons in treating instant stenosis being not statistically significant in the study from Dick and Al, uh, where the cutting balloon demonstrated a 65% uh, primary patency compared, uh, sorry, a stenosis rate compared to plain old balloon balloons, uh, balloon angioplasty which was 73%. Drug coated balloons, this has Gain a lot of attention in the recent uh, couple of years uh, following the meta-analysis from Okatsanos, as you all very well know. In terms of the field of instant stenosis, cutting balloons uh, from the most available studies have demonstrated a significant, as you can see here, um, benefit compared to plain old balloons in treating instant stenosis in the primary patency with uh, the debate study demonstrating an 8.5% compared to 71.8% for plain old balloon angioplasty uh, for treating instant stenosis. A difference in the debate track that has been not been kept into the uh, long term, the three years where the TLR had no difference between the two different modalities. Now, in terms of the drag code balloon, we also have the FAIR trial, which was also demonstrated earlier, which had 119 patients enrolled and randomized between plain uh, plaquetaxel coated balloons and plain old balloon angioplasty with a six month result significantly better for uh, stenosis in terms of the stenosis for the plaquetaxel balloons and one year sustained uh, results significantly better for uh, stenosis in terms of the stenosis rate for the plaquetaxel coated balloons compared to plain old balloons. However, again, the TLR were good, but we don't, we are waiting for long-term results. In my opinion, it seems that there is an effect from the drug. However, I'm not a personal believer, regardless of the uh, debate regarding the mortality in the paclitaxel in using the critical ischemia. I'm in favor of the serolimus, so I'm not really sure what will the end uh, and long-term results will show about that. Now, as I said, there aren't current results. However, we don't know if there will be a catch-up. And despite the fact that these balloons have a drug which helps with the stenosis rate, again, the hypothetical lumen gain is restricted in the case of the balloon by the previous stand. So although they may have an effect, I don't believe that they will be a, a stay for the future in the terms of the long-term results. Now, Another proposed technique that has been uh, used in terms to treat the instant stenosis is the applying us of the drug eluding stents. Again, encourages the result but limited data. The best result we have is from the Silver PTX Global Registry, where they enrolled 100 patients, 108 patients treated for PTL instant stenosis, which showed a 
with the third three of, of them having a complete stent occlusion, so being on that classification, a class three in standard stenosis. The primary patency of those patients was 78.8% at one year, and the TLR of TLR three of 81% at one year. Although this was again encouraging, the main problem in this case, which I don't again, I don't favor the use of another standing stand, is because the extra metal increases the thrombotic surface and also alters the compliance of the superficial femoral artery, making it more rigid and restricts as well the max lumen gain. As if the previous stand had a small restriction, this adds a second stand adds to this with a strut thickness to the further decrease in the lumen gain. Cover stands again, they have been proposed, they have been used. I'm not in favor, I'm just putting my uh, opinion on that. The advantage of this is that they exclude the ultimate from the vessel lumen. Again, they have the same problems. There is extra metal that is restricted in the max lumen gain. Both the uh, previous stand and the plus stand thickness decreases the uh, overall lumen gain that can be achieved. And my main uh, concern about this type of stands, the cover stands and the superficial femoral artery is that you exclude the collaterals so in a case of the thrombose stand, then you can have a patient in a very, very, very difficult critical situation. Atherectomy has more recently been favored by many operators in treating this kind of patients. It's effectively debulks the neointimal tissues from the instant stenosis. It has significant advantages, in my opinion, in the treatment of the instant stenosis. It, unfortunately, the data, available data are limited. However, there is, in my opinion, again, very promising concept we can, uh, there are different types. There's the laser atherectomy and the excisional atherectomy, which can be divided in directional and rotational. My personal experience is mainly the rotational and the jet stream, and I will show you a couple of, uh, an example later. Uh, limited data, I will not stay on this because I don't think the quality of the study demonstrates the, the, uh, uh, the future benefits of this kind of technology. The one thing that I can tell you is that the jet stream, which is a most a lot more recent device entering the um, uh, the fight against the uh, CLI, is that demonstrate the six month primary patency of 72% when used in the uh, field of in, in treating in standard stenosis. The idea about debulking is that when we use anthrectomy, we manage to enlarge the vascular lumen by removing tissue by with, from the inside the vessel, uh, while when we use balloon angioplasty, instead of removing the tissue, we just directly stretch the vessel in order to create the space. Uh, of course, these are the trials. However, the everyday practice is completely different. There are needs. An operator that deals with this patient needs to combine different techniques to deal with different problems and different situations. Um, this is a message for the juniors. They need to be prepared to use all the above devices and techniques separately or combined. In my opinion, there is no algorithm. My preference as an advice is to try even using retrograde or undergrade or a combination of techniques to stay intraluminal and try to use a debulking atherectomy in order to remove and reduce the burden of the extra material that is causing the instant stenosis. Uh, a couple of cases. This is a case of a 70-year-old female ex-smoker, diabetic, who had a history of CLI treated two years prior to the admission that you will see in a, uh, in a minute. It was treated with a full metal jacket from the common femoral artery bifurcation to the pop using Sufera stents all the way down. She presented with a CLI following a stent occlusion noted three months prior to the cadre admission. She wasn't treated, she was left because she was asymptomatic at that point. She was left by an, from another hospital with uh, no treatment offered. She presented to us with CLI and, the, was, and this was the image from her angiogram. As you can see, there is flash occlusion with a long stent, the extended segment down to the popliteal, two vessels run off with a good run off to the posterior tibial artery. So, We've managed to cross this. I've managed to cross this one using a straight stiff room and an ugly catheter from the top with an undergrade approach. No need for a retrograde access. 
but in case that this was not feasible, there is always the option to puncture the occluded stent. And as an advice, someone can even puncture the occluded stent, stent uh, at the uh, level of the adductor canal, or if someone favors to puncture uh, retrograde the, uh, the tibial arteries, my recommendation is to try to puncture the occluded anterior tibial artery at its origin, which is quite easy to see with the ultrasound and no need to turn the patient around and puncture the popliteal artery for these cases. So minus to cross it, minus to cross interluminal, stay interluminal. You have to be very, very patient and have to follow your wire quite carefully and follow it with a, with a catheter in order to make sure that you're not going outside the struts. As you can see, this was treated with the a therectomy device with the jet stream. You can see the jet stream passing. Uh, because this device is quite powerful, when you use it in the supera stent, you can actually see the stent. Unfortunately, I don't have the video, but you can see the, the stent pumping and uh, shrinking as it, um, the device goes through it. It's recommended to pass it twice, one with the blades uh, down and one with the blades up. Another recommendation for the juniors for me, because there is a lot of debate about if you should use filters for these cases or not. I don't use filters usually. What I tend to do is to not to leave untreated the first centimeter of the vessel on the top and leave untreated the, uh, the one centimeter of the vessel at the bottom, which helps us a natural filter. So in that way, I work in a closed system with no flow. There is no flow from the top to allow any uh, debris to be pushed down and there is no flow at the bottom because we have the cap at the bottom to allow any debris created to be flying down to the tibials. So once we clear, once I clear the whole stand with the jet stream uh, in the closed system, then at that point and only then, I treat first the top cap in order to uh, allow flow into the stand. And once this is finishing, I treat the bottom cap and allow flow through. Another tip is to try to go very, very slowly. So use the device extremely slow to allow for the device to aspirate back. And the device comes in two different uh, sizes. Uh, one which has a maximum diameter of 3.4 and one which has a maximum of 2.8. So don't use the big device. The big device tends to create big chunks of uh, debris which potentially can be tricky or challenging from the device to aspirate them back and those are the ones that they will cause the embolization. So avoid to use the big device because we may have problems aspirating those big debris back into the system. This is the, uh, the, the contrast after following the passage. You can see that I haven't treated the top one yet, the top cup yet, so that's why you see the, uh, the, the flow. If it was a dynamic uh, run, you would have seen stagnation, but this is how it looks. Uh, following the uh, the atherectomy, the lesion is the the instant stenosis. The, the the whole segment is balloon angioplasty with a conventional balloon or a drag balloon, depending on the operator. And this was the final result, as you can see. Of course, despite all the things that I have said, there was a small embolus down, but there was causing no problem. And the main outflow vessel, which was the posterior tibial artery, remained patent with a good perfusion of the foot and the patient did great. Second case, very quickly, I will try to be quicker because I know we have some pressure with timing. 83-year-old uh, male with hyperlimia and hypertension, presented with CLI, had the previous cover stent placed in the right superficial femoral artery, which developed all of the stent, as you can see, there was a vibrant stent, state patent, developed an instant, a, a marginal stent, stent uh, occlusion at the proximal stent. So, at this stage, you can see the vibrant here and the occlusion. Try to cross from the undergrade approach, failed. Try to use the re-entry device to re-enter into the vibrant stand, again failed. In this case, as I said, we try always to try to stay intraluminal. So again, I tried and I punctured retrograde the vibrant stand, managed to get into the patent stand and managed to get through to the occlusion. However, again, ended up in a subitimal plane. And what I did next, I used an outback retrograde in order to re-enter and connect the two subitimal planes at that level of the uh, marginal instantaneous stenosis segment, snare the wire out, convert to um, a through and through, and finally place a covered stand because 
of the extra luminal, complete extra luminal approach in this case, and a final good result. A third case, just to tell you that even if you don't manage to cross intraluminal lesion, that's not the end of the world. This is a below the knee anterior tibial artery occlusion, actually three vessel occlusion with a previously treated anterior tibial artery with a stem. You may be able to see the stem here. You can actually see it better here. This is a drug eluting sirolimus eluting coronary stent that has in the Europe, uh, some of these stents has C mark for using the below the knee area. And actually they perform really well with good evidence compared to plain old balloon angioplasty and bare stents. And there is a good evidence and they have C mark for uh, this uh, use, the sirolimus eluting stents. The stent was occluded. It was unfortunately impossible to cross it intraluminal despite the undergrade and the retrograde approach. So here, what I did, I used uh, an undergrade approach, CXI caster and a half stiff terumo, which is my preferable wire for a non-calcified tibial uh, subminimal occlusion, half stiff terumo, O35 wire, managed to cross substand, not inside the stand, this is um, extra stand, uh, outside of the previous stand, and managed to re-enter, as you can see here, with a half stiff terumo at the level of the dorsalis pedis. Following that, uh, balloon angioplasty, although the flow was good because of the presence of the previous stand and the fracture at that point, I placed a second stand with excellent flow at the end when excluding the uh, standing segment. We have used this technique, which we call substand or double barrel technique a few times, when the intraluminal crossing of the occluded stand is not possible, we don't send the patients for a bypass. We try to cross them and double barrel stand them. Um, sorry for taking a bit longer. Uh, as a conclusion, I think that paclitaxel balloons provide the benefit at six months in cases with instant stenosis, but we don't have evidence that this uh, benefit lasts in the long term. Uh, plain angioplasty is definitely not effective treatment strategy based on the data that we have. In my opinion, a therectomy plus angioplasty is a promising concept. And unfortunately, I cannot give you a definite algorithm of how to treat these patients. There is no single default strategy. You have to use all your tools, all your knowledge, and try to cross and restore the flow in order to save the leg of the patient who suffers. Thank you very much for your attention and very happy to answer any questions if there are dr diamantopoulos thank you so very much for that really comprehensive overview of how to manage isr um really admire the uh result you got with that double barrel technique that's something i've not tried before that uh, that was really crazy that was uh, that was really inter interesting so thank you thank you very much you're welcome I think Dr. Verbatical is still trying to figure out uh, uh, issues with the audio. Uh, unfortunately, he's been having some. Uh, so while he is, I just spoke to him while he is doing that, we can go ahead with Dr. Chumala. Okay, very good. Uh, Dr. Tamala is going to be speaking to us in regards to deep venous arterialization, a technique I'm certainly very excited to hear about in our CLI patients. And uh, Dr. Uh, Tumala comes to us from Florida, and he is the medical director at, at Lakeland Vascular Institute in Central Florida, where he's been in practice for nine years. They are certainly a very busy hospital system, covering five hospitals and the busiest single site ER in the country, which I imagine has been significantly impacted with the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tamala for joining us today and uh, without further ado please uh, go ahead and uh, share with us deep venous arterialization. Thank you for the gracious uh, introduction Dr. Uganskis. Um, just want to make sure okay, can you all see my slides? Yes. Great. So I have 10 minutes to give you the rundown on, on the most complex topic probably a controversial topic uh, deep venous arterialization. And without further overdo, uh, let's dive in. My disclosure is relevant to that topic. And, and to start with the basics, what, what is a DVA? A, a DVA is, is basically 
creating a fistula between the artery and the vein and disrupting the venous valves so that we can use a vein as a conduit for blood supply in patients that don't have any arterial uh, supply to the foot. You can achieve this multiple ways, open endovascular, um, hybrid. My talk, my talk is gonna highlight the percutaneous approach. Where do we, where do we do DVA? These are patients who are facing amputation. This is their last ditch effort to save the limb. They don't have any options in the vascular or open. And a patient on the left here had a previous transmeritorsal amputation, had a non-healing pressure wound with associated PAD. He underwent DVA and you can see granulation tissue um, uh, in, in the wound that is progressively healing and we still are in the process of treating the wound. On the right, clearly a bit late for, for a DVA. An angiographic appearance uh, in these patients, a typical appearance would be somebody with severe um, medial wall calcinosis, somebody on diabetes, somebody has a long-standing um, dialysis. They don't have any reasonable targets in the foot on the major arterial site. They also have accompanying small vessel disease that complicates uh, treatment using conventional techniques. Do, what, what data do we have as of this mo moment for supporting DVA? The ALPS registry reported back in May this, this past year, this year has a 67% amputation-free survival over 24 months. So we have a two-year follow-up showing a pretty significant amputation-free survival and three-fourths of the wounds have healed completely at two years. In the States, Dr. Mustafa has a, a PROMISE 1 and now a PROMISE 2 enrollment. Um, they, they were using Limflow system, and that demonstrated about one-third of, um, one of patients showing complete wound healing at six months. A recent article from Journal of Vascular Surgery, um, it, it, it reviewed multiple studies that has open approach, percutaneous approach, and a hybrid approach, and the limb salvage rates are, are reported at 60 to 70 percent. That is that's, that's pretty good. And given some of them were six month and 10 month follow up, that's still a, a win in my book if you're able to uh, save the leg uh, for that period of time, especially with no options to begin with. Our experience we have started offering this in the past couple of years. Um, we've got to have an honest discussion with patients prior to the procedure. One, you got to make sure to tell them it's off label. Uh, secondly, not the standard of care yet. Um, we, we have to be setting the expectations right. By, by expectations, right, I give them about a 50% chance of procedural success, maybe a 50% chance of limb salvage. And we have learned uh, many lessons along the way um, from, from the approach perspective, from the workup perspective, from the technique perspective, and, and even follow up post procedure care and, and, um, and um, sort of having a multidisciplinary approach after performing a successful DVA. So, with a couple of cases, I'm going to share how we evolved with the technique of creating a percutaneous diffidence arterialization. Here's a patient who has rest pain as well as minor tissue loss, making him a brother for category five. Um, he also had a, exactly the same picture on the other leg, and to the point even when they tried sympathetectomy that did not work. And we attempted a DVA on the other side that was not a technical success, and, and patients succumbed to amputation on the, on the other leg. That made it even more important to save this leg, and, and we embarked on, on doing a DVA. Um, one of the things, one of the things I want to mention here. This is I'm going to slow down a bit on this slide. This is probably the most important slide from a technique perspective. Patient preparation. Um, these can be anywhere from two to four hour procedures. So anesthesia is, is our preference, if especially patient can can get uh, clearance for it. Um, an arterial anti-grade axis with a seven foot sheath on the venous side. When I'm talking about venous, the axis is in in the pedal venous axis side. Uh, you, you have to have a six front sheet so that you can accommodate stent placement if you have to. Our target for fistula creation for the most part is posterior tibial artery to the posterior tibial vein. Occasionally, TP trunk if the anatomy is not favorable in the posterior tibial artery. Anterior tibial to the anterior tibial vein is possible, but, but kind of rare in our experience. How do we create a fistula between the artery and the vein? 
There are several techniques out there, several techniques published. Clearly, we don't have Lumi flow in, in, in the stage for commercial use. So we're basically using off label application of devices like re-entry devices, Outback Pioneer. We started using gun sight technique uh, within the past year. Uh, it has tremendously reduced our procedural times um, by probably half. And, and also, it's a relatively inexpensive option to the re-entry devices. Once you make it, once you create a pistol, then the next thing is to place a, a, a stent on the venous side as well as the arterial inflow. One of the most important lessons I have learned is you got to treat the pedal venous loop with utmost respect because <laughs> dictate the success of these procedures. Here's the, one of the earliest experience, patient supine, the, the groin ipsilateral was prepped and, and, and the foot itself. Anti-grid ultrasound guided micropuncture technique access into the common femoral artery, the same anti-grid, uh, uh, sorry, retrograde access in the ankle and on the venous side, um, having a tourniquet up helps. But I got to tell you, boy, it's not as easy as it seems to get pedal venous access. I mean, as, as radiology background, we've probably done hundreds of pick lines. This is actually one of the tougher, tougher portions, in my opinion. Sometimes it takes a little while to gain access into the pedal vein. You may have to get a superficial vein, pump up the system with fluids, uh, beef up the uh, venous channels, and apply a tourniquet, and that may help. Here's a picture showing the venous sheath in the medial plantar vein. And this is a slender sheet that accommodates placement of a biobond stent, which we were trying in this case, if needed. So let's go back to how we create the fistula. So you have a, a pioneer device in this case. The pioneer is placed through the arterial axis and degraded in the femoral artery. We have the pioneer placed into the TP trunk and, and proximal uh, posterior tibial. You have a venous target marked by the arrow. It can be a balloon, it can be a wire. In this case, we used a balloon. One of the key elements here is to make sure the proximity of the artery and vein are close in various projections. You don't want to have a, a gap between artery and vein that may lead to um, bleeding and, and compartment syndrome and stuff. So after confirming that we're close, we used, uh, we used an opacified balloon as the target in the vein, used the Pioneer device to perforate the balloon, and uses a fluoroscopic confirmation that we are indeed in the vein. Then basically you advance a support catheter, like quick cross seeker from the artery into the vein. The next important, important part is to get this wire past the venous axis as far distal as you can. I think this is very important you know, for, uh, for the success of DVA. You want to very be careful, respect the valves, do not perforate, try to get as distal as possible. This was the initial experience where we were just angioplasting up to the medial or lateral plantar vein. Once, once you're done, you angioplast your way up from the vein, up to the artery or venous fistula site, and after angioplasting, essentially deploy a, a stent graft, which is why one is what our preference is. You want to exclude the venous collaterals that can drain this um, blood away from the from the distal uh, limb. So you want to put a wire bond. Uh, we typically start off at the mid calcaneal level where there's a valve that, that inherently sits in the common plantar vein. So you want to get just past that valve, but not too far into the foot because you don't necessarily have to want to exclude the other uh, fetal ven venous structures. So essentially, a wire bond in the vein and then extend proximally you have several options for the arterial side and across the anastomosis, you could potentially use the same wire bone, you can use a VBX. So let's say you use a five millimeter VBX and blow it up to three and a half, three millimeters, um, and, and then flare up the end where you have overlap with the wire bone. Or you can use a coronary drug eluting stent. Um, this, is, this is after uh, an, uh, the initial, the first DVA we did, uh, we have a little bit of extravasation in the foot, but completion angiogram show, um, shows the filling of the venous structures. This was me first time hearing the Doppler of a successful DVA. I'm going to hold it for a second. So the angiographic appearance of this particular case I just showed is 
where you got nice in arterial inflow, nice filling of the via bone, and then filling of the venous structures in the foot. You want to see as much filling into the midfoot, or preferably into the forefoot. You want to flood the foot with blood from the venous side. And how does this clinically relate? This is the same patient at two months. You can see the right leg that we had, we had failed at DVA creation had an amputation relatively a few days after. The, on the side, we were successful. And this is another point I want to stress. The post DVA storm is a real thing. Patients experience ex excruciating pain and swelling and redness. You want to educate the patient and also educate the referral because uh, at a time or two, they have sent the patient out to amputation thinking either there's an infection or patient cannot tolerate this pain. So education here, education and communication here is key. At two months, they have a little bit of a swelling um, and you know, wound healing in the process. At, this is a 10 month picture. Now up to 12 months where clinically we have a patient notice pain, wounds, are, wounds have healed and they started to re-emerge again. And we're trying to get the patient back with COVID-19, our hands are a bit tired, uh, tired. but uh, I, think, I think we'll get him back to uh, healing again. This is about 12 months since the initial DVA. Use, from using re-entry devices that took a while, um, now we have started using the gun site technique. That for that, our approach is, uh, is different even from the uh, prepping stage, right? Because in gun site, you're essentially uh, piercing the calf percutaneously, and you want to be able to have the leg entirely clean. So we bring the leg out through the drape, uh, prep it from the groin all the way, and then put a second sterile drape under uh, in anticipation of patients who will get gun site technique. This is a patient here, a single vessel peroneal runoff, some reconstitution uh, for the heel ulcer, um, it, uh, you know, very small arteries in the DP and PT distribution. However, um, you know, once we tried to recanalize, we were unsuccessful and we, we employed the gun site technique here. Um, a full disclaimer is there's no short version of this. I'm going to try to highlight this. If you have any questions, please always reach out to Deacon DM, DM me on my Twitter. But in essence, what we're doing here is we have a, we have a snare in the artery and a snare in the vein at the point where you want to create a fistula. The same rule applies. Use fluoroscopy to make sure they are in close proximity. And then you have an, a, a 21 gauge needle micropuncture acoustic. We connect the darts. There's a needle going in from the calf, the, wi the wire externalized. So once you have the wire, in these cases, we use either a V18 or a V14, and you, you have traversed both snares, you want to externalize that external wire either up, up out of the groin or from the pedal approach. Once you have that, I pass a catheter from the, from, in this case was a groin exit. So we passed a 035 catheter that would allow you to pass a second 014 wire through the venous snare. Then you can take your external wire out and basically uh, finish the loop. Uh, and now we have a crossover wire from the artery to the vein. Um, and then you wanna do the same thing, go past the venous axis into the pedal venous loop. One other thing to mention, these valves can be extremely hard um, without a valve tone, they're extremely hard to break. So sometimes you may have to use a non-compliant um, high pressure balloon systems. Um, in this case, we, we just got away with a, a non-compliant balloon. And then there's the wire bone in the venous site, and then the uh, pedal venous loop angioplasty, which I think tremendously adds to the success of these procedures. There's post uh, DVA and, and the wound blush in the heel area. This patient was healing nicely. We have about a four week follow-up since the DVA presentation. Unfortunately, he succumbed to urosepsis, um, supposedly from indwelling polycatheter. But if, if we had him around, I think that would have been a great testament of the efficacy of this procedure. Um, final completion angiogram, another patient with the same, using perfusion imaging, you can see the dramatic uh, difference between the perfusion of the venous system compared to um, um, uh, pre-DVA. As far as distal, uh, deep, uh, distal P, uh, percutaneous DVA, um, very limited experience. Um, I've done a couple of cases and I just want to quickly highlight, highlight what we do here. Um, in, in essence, somebody who has good arterial supply up to the ankle and no op options below, then you, you can attempt this. 
Uh, the data is very limited. Uh, I am not sure if this, these are uh, durable, uh, this is durable procedure or what the patency rates are. But one thing I know, you don't have to put a stent in, you may have to use coiling to force um, blood into the foot. So here's a patient who had a pretty good posterior tibial artery, single vessel on off of the ankle for a non-healing uh, wound in the great toe. So um, we have a, a, a plantar venous axis, uh, anti-grade. I like to put a tourniquet up and study the venous anatomy. And here we are pumping the system with contrast, sort of identified by target under fluoroscopy. And here the target appears to be the lateral plantar because that's the main vein in this particular patient's venous anatomy. And using um, the fluoroscopy guidance, um, access the lateral plantar vein. And there's a needle going into the lateral plantar vein. And then we put an acoustic uh, system. Um, and the same, you go up to the reconstituted, um, you go up to the patent arterial portion. Here there's a, a posterior tibial artery that's patent up to here. Put a snare from the arterial side. The same thing, a, a, a snare from the venous side. You can use a gun side technique with a micropunction needle and uh, finish the case uh, with angioplasty. And that's the completion uh, run where you can see a nice filling of the venous loop in, in the foot. Um, completion uh, angiography in this patient, you got pretty good arterial supply up to the foot. And then as you see lower down in, 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 the, in the foot, you will have the venous loop uh, um, the opacification and, uh, and drainage. Uh, this patient we're still currently following. And like I said, very limited data on percutaneous DVA. So in conclusion, uh, percutaneous DVA continues to evolve. The, we need more validation studies. Uh, preliminary data is still, uh, it is promising, and I hope we can save some limbs uh, with more data to support it. My pups, Johnny and June Cash, um, shout out to them. They had <laughs> listened to this talk several times while I was putting it all together. Um, shout out to you all for listening to it once. Um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, join me on Twitter and at T in the Let Quote. Dr. Tamala, thank you so very much. That was really extraordinary. Um, so one question I have for you is, how long does one of these cases take you? I'm just kind of curious, you know, um, from the perspective of budgeting time in the lab, um, you know, that first case that you showed, um, how, how long did that take? So the first one uh, um, what was about four, four and a half hours. Um, and yes, you're right. We pretty much cleared the schedule and plan it, and plan it electively. Um, and uh, four and a half hours. And then once we started employing gun sight technique, um, our procedural times were ho hovering around two, two and a half hours. Um, the, okay. last one, the last one we did was, was actually under an hour and a half, but it is somewhere wow. a dozen cases before we got to that, uh, to that experience. So um, you're right. I mean, you got to plan well ahead of time and, uh, and clear the schedule. Very good. Thank you so very much. Yeah, Dr. Tumble, I had a question. You know, the concept is intriguing, but, you know, typically when I think of a fistula, an AV fistula, I think of steel from the distal organ. Um, how are you getting, like, what is the, the pathophys where you're getting oxygenation of the end organ and re removal of kind of byproducts, CO2, et cetera, from the end organ without going through the kind of native capillary network? That's a good question, Georgie. And I, I think that the role of having the stent graft forcing the blood, we're essentially creating venous hypertension, right? And that venous hypertension in the wound is, is that the theory here is there's enough oxygenation for the wound to heal from the venous aspect. Um, as far as the byproducts and stuff, you still have a ton of collaterals in, in, the, in the foot to carry out the you know, normal arterial supply in and, and the byproduct. But primarily what we noticed is, I don't have TCPO2 per se to prove it. Like, like I said, this is very preliminary. Um, but clinically, when I see that wound granulation, I have actually put out this collars. After they do a transmit, you, you, there's, there's, there's gush of blood. So uh, I think the, the venous side kind of gets arterialized and then the venous hypertension does help with uh, a perfusion from the back, back door. Uh, I don't know if, if that explains it, but that's the working theory right now. So, Dr. Tamala, can I ask, one of the problems, you know, we've tried doing a few of these cases, and one of the big problems is always dealing with the valves. Do you have any, any tips on, uh, on how to, 
how to prevent that uh, or how to get the blood to flow forward without uh, the valves obstructing the flow? That, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Shero. To me, um, I guess we you can try cutting balloons, right? I, I do, as long as I can get a wire bond in, I can go real aggressive using non-compliant balloons. You could, you could potentially use the Japanese technique of taking a micropuncture needle and try to shear the valve percutaneously, right? Some, some folks have suggested using shockwave, and I haven't done that myself. But for the most part, um, then these can be really challenging. And I, I think it'll be curious, I'm very curious to see when Lumi Flow becomes commercially available and their Valvertom, in my opinion, their or even surgical Valvertoms might make a, a ton of a difference, um, you know, in getting better patency rates on the venous side. Any role uh, for cutting? For that, that Valvertom is really good for the lymph flow. I, I, sorry, I you broke up for a second. Sorry, the, you said about the valvotum. The valvotum is really, really, really good. Uh, but sometimes you still need to use compliant balloons and tracking balloons. But the valvotum does make a difference, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Shira brought up an interesting point. What about kind of using like the uh, endo ABF kind of technology, like wavelength or something of that nature, or ellipsis even? That's, that's, that's a great thought, uh, Giorgi. Um, I actually recently signed an NDA, <laughs> you know, trying to work, you know, we're trying to work, the, work a similar system. So, um, yes, it, it's in the works. And I, I think that's a great, great thought. Uh, and it, I'll be curious to see once, once uh, we do some testing, you know, in an animal lab and see the feasibility of things, uh, it might be an opportunity um, down the road. Well, that was a great discussion. I definitely learned a lot. Um, do you guys have any like closing remarks or advice for uh, the trainees who are going to be listening to this before we close this meeting? I think uh, Dr. Warwadecker is he wasn't able to uh, like log on and give his talk, so um, we're going to start closing this now. No, I think this is a another great session. Um, you know, I'm glad that the we had a kind of all star panel both the moderators and panelists and trainees that were running this and uh, appreciate Keith Pereira and Kumar Matisari and uh, the uh, the group that's been kind of heavily involved in getting this going, medical students. Uh, you can see the importance of um, supervascular and cardiovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease and and all the tools and you know options that we have for these quote unquote no option CLI patients. So. Make sure you get this during your, um, you know, medical school training and your uh, internship or residency and throughout. And so, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. So, if you have any questions, you can reach out to any of us on the, on the, uh, on the phone call, and I'll shoot my email as well. Thank you guys thank for participating. Yeah, thank you all for participating. Uh, there will be another uh, PAD boot camp in about a month or so. It'll be announced on all of, like the social media platforms um, with another all-star panel, just like today. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you guys all for um, your time. And um, again, this will be posted on the RFS YouTube channel if you uh, missed it or if you need to watch it again to make sure you learned everything like me. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. I appreciate the invite, thank you. Thank you. That was a great session. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you again. Uh, we'll see you after six weeks. Thank you. Oh. Bye. Thanks.